February 18, 1945. Oranienburg Airfield, Germany. 800 meters altitude. Lieutenant Erwin Ziller felt the Horton Ho 229 shudder beneath him. A predator made of wood and steel, slicing through frozen German skies at speeds no piston fighter could match. For 45 minutes, the flying wing had performed flawlessly. A sleek delta shape with no tail, no fuselage, just a pure, uninterrupted sweep of wings stretching 55 feet from tip to tip. The twin Junkers Yumo 004 turbojets howled behind him, pushing the revolutionary aircraft towards speeds approaching 1,000 kilometers per hour. Then, the right engine exploded. Black smoke erupted, hydraulic fluid sprayed across the cockpit glass, and the aircraft lurched violently to one side. Ziller, a veteran Luftwaffe test pilot, didn't panic. He threw the Ho-229 into a series of desperate dives and climbs, trying to windmill the dead engine back to life, fighting the asymmetric thrust threatening to flip the tailless aircraft into an uncontrollable spin. Four 360-degree turns, wings banked at 20 degrees. He deployed the landing gear at 400 meters using emergency compressed air. Ground control watched helplessly. He never used his radio. He never ejected from the primitive seat. Witnesses would later speculate he'd been overcome by toxic fumes from the burning engine. The Ho-229 V2 spiraled into the earth just beyond the airfield boundary. Ziller was thrown from the aircraft on impact, his body striking a tree near a railway crossing guard's house. He died instantly from a broken neck. The prototype, the only jet-powered flying wing that had ever successfully flown, was utterly destroyed. With it died Germany's last chance to deploy an aircraft so advanced, so revolutionary, that it wouldn't be matched until the American B-2 Spirit Bomber took flight more than four decades later. This is the story of what Hitler's engineers almost achieved, and why the Allies should be grateful they ran out of time. Before we continue deeper into this unbelievable story, take a second to like this video and subscribe for more untold war stories. By 1943, the Allies had won the Battle of Britain and established air superiority over Europe. RAF Spitfires and American P-51 Mustangs dominated German skies. The British Chain Home Radar Network, the world's first integrated air defense system, could detect incoming German bombers from miles away, vectoring fighters to intercept them with devastating efficiency. Allied bomber crews had grown confident in their missions. German interceptors were fast, yes. The ME-262 jet could reach 870 kilometers per hour. But they appeared on radar like beacons, giving defenders precious minutes of warning. The Luftwaffe's conventional bombers, meanwhile, were being slaughtered. Losses during raids over Britain had become catastrophic. We owned the skies, one RAF pilot would later recall. Jerry's bombers came in formations we could see from 20 miles out. Their fighters were predictable. We knew when they were coming, where they were going, and we were always there waiting. The Allies believed German aviation technology had peaked, that jet engines were fuel-hungry curiosities with limited tactical value, that radar had made aerial surprise attacks obsolete forever. Then, British intelligence began receiving fragmentary reports about something new being developed at Friedrich Rota, something without a tail something that flew like a bat. In March 1943, Luftwaffe chief Hermann Göring issued an impossible challenge, the three-time 1,000 requirement. He demanded a bomber capable of carrying 1,000 kilograms of bombs over 1,000 kilometers at 1,000 kilometers per hour. Every major German aviation firm rejected it as fantasy. The new turbojet engines could provide the speed but they guzzled fuel so voraciously that meeting the range requirement seemed mathematically impossible. Brothers Reimar and Walter Horton had a different answer. Eliminate drag entirely. The Hortons had been experimenting with tailless flying wings since the 1930s, building gliders that flew with eerie stability despite having no vertical stabilizers, no horizontal tails, nothing to create parasitic drag. Their insight was radical. In a conventional aircraft, 40% of the structure exists purely to control the other 60%. The fuselage carries no lift. 
the tail creates drag. A pure flying wing, however, generates lift across its entire surface, while presenting minimal resistance to the air. When they proposed the HO-229, Goering allocated 500,000 Reichsmarks, a fortune, and gave them six months. The Physics of Stealth The HO-229's shape was dictated by aerodynamics, not radar evasion, but inadvertently, it became history's first stealth aircraft. With no tail fins to reflect electromagnetic waves, no protruding cockpit, and smooth curves blending engines into the wing roots, the aircraft presented a radar cross-section 20% smaller than a compact Messerschmitt Bf 109 fighter, despite having nearly double the wingspan. British chain home radars, which operated at relatively long wavelengths, would detect it at only 80% of normal range. Those precious missing minutes meant fewer fighters could intercept, fewer anti-aircraft batteries could track. The Hortons even used wood, not for stealth, but for weight savings and wartime material shortages. Wood happened to be transparent to certain radar frequencies. Rymar Horton later claimed, controversially, that he'd mixed charcoal into the laminating adhesive to absorb radar energy though chemical analyses of the surviving V-3 prototype found conflicting evidence. Speed through efficiency On December 2, 1944, the HO-229 V-1 glider prototype proved the concept. Towed aloft, it flew with shocking stability, no tail, yet controllable through split ailerons and spoilers alone. The powered V-2 followed on February 2, 1945. Test pilot Erwin Ziller climbed to altitude and opened the throttles. The twin turbojets screamed. Ground crews watched the sleek Delta accelerate faster than any aircraft they'd ever seen, climbing at 1,320 meters per minute, substantially faster than the ME-262. Top speed estimates ranged between 845 kilometers per hour in level flight to potentially over 1,000 kilometers per hour in a dive it could have outrun every Allied fighter in the sky. The dogfight that never happened. One test flight reportedly pitted the Ho-229 V-2 against an ME-262 in a mock engagement. The ME-262 was Germany's premier jet interceptor, flown by aces with hundreds of kills. The Ho-229, piloted by a test pilot in an experimental prototype, outmaneuvered it. The flying wing's lack of fuselage drag and massive wing surface area gave it turning performance that bordered on impossible for a jet aircraft. One witness described it as watching a manta ray hunting sharks. Goering, electrified by the test results, ordered 40 Ho-229 production aircraft before the V-2 had even completed its first flight. The order expanded to 100 within weeks. Gotire Wagonfabrik began tooling factories in Friedrich Rota to mass-produce the fighter-bomber. Engineers designed the A0 production variant with two 30mm MK-108 cannons, weapons that could shred a B-17 bomber with a handful of shells. Plans called for the Ho-229 to be deployed on three fronts, as an interceptor. Armed with cannons, it would slash through Allied bomber formations faster than escort fighters could react then vanish before defensive gunners could track it. As a fast bomber, carrying 1,000 kilograms of explosives, it could strike London, reaching the target before radar provided adequate warning, then escape before Spitfires could climb to intercept altitude. As a reconnaissance platform, its speed and reduced radar signature made it ideal for photographic missions deep into Allied territory. By March 12, 1945, the Ho-229 was included in the jaeger Not program, Hitler's emergency fighter program demanding mass production of wonder weapons to reverse Germany's collapsing air war. An intercepted Luftwaffe communication fragment from April 1945 captures the desperation and hope. Wenn das Hortenflugzeug rechtzeitig einsatzbereit ist, können wir den Himmel zurückerobern. If the Horten aircraft becomes operational in time, we can reclaim the skies. It never did. Allied pilots never faced the HO-229 in combat, but the psychological terror of encountering such an aircraft haunted post-war strategic planning for decades. 
Imagine, you're a B-17 tail gunner over Germany. Your formation has 50 bombers escorted by 30 P-51 Mustangs. Radar gave you 20 minutes warning before German fighters usually arrived. But today, the radar screens show almost nothing. Just faint, intermittent returns that controllers dismiss as interference. Then, without warning, a shape materializes five miles out. No visible fuselage, no tail, just a black delta streaking toward your formation at 950 kilometers per hour. Your escorts try to intercept, but it's already past them, closing on your bomber at a speed differential of 300 kilometers per hour. The 30 millimeter cannons open fire. Your friend's B-17 disintegrates in a fireball. The shape rolls inverted and dives away, vanishing from sight before your own gunners can traverse their turrets. You never hear it coming. You barely see it leave. British Air Ministry analysts who examined the captured HO-229V3 prototype in April 1945 wrote sobering assessments. One report noted, Had this aircraft entered service in numbers, our daylight bombing campaign would have required fundamental reassessment. Radar alone would provide insufficient warning. A USAAF technical intelligence officer wrote, The psychological impact of an aircraft this advanced appearing suddenly over Allied formations cannot be overstated. It represents a paradigm shift in aerial warfare. But revolutionary technology means nothing without industrial capacity. And by 1945, Germany had neither time nor resources. The Horton brothers were brilliant designers, but not factory managers. Reimar Horton had no formal aeronautical engineering degree. His genius was intuitive, experimental, when production shifted to Gotthier Wagenfabrik, the company allegedly undermined the project, hoping to advance its own competing flying wing design instead. Bureaucratic infighting, material shortages, and Allied bombing raids crippled progress. By April 1945, only the V-3 prototype was nearing completion, roughly 80% finished. The V-4, V-5, and V-6 prototypes existed as partial airframes scattered across workshops. No production HO-229 had been completed. No operational pilot training had occurred. No tactics had been developed. On April 14, 1945, soldiers of General George Patton's 3rd Army rolled into Friedrichroda. They found the HO-229 V-3's center section, cockpit, engines, and landing gear, sitting in a factory alongside the outer wing panels stored 75 miles away. American intelligence immediately recognized its significance. Under Operation Paperclip, they shipped the V-3 to the United States for evaluation, denying the Soviets access to this revolutionary technology. The HO-229 went to Northrop Corporation, the American company that had been independently developing flying wing bombers since 1940. Jack Northrop's engineers examined every centimeter of the German prototype, though Northrop himself had already proven the flying wing concept viable through his YB-35 and YB-49 designs. One factory worker's account survives in Allied interrogation records. We built three wings every month, but engines never arrived. We had no aluminum for control surfaces. The Fuhrer demanded miracles, but we had only sawdust and prayers. When the Americans came, we showed them everything, better them than the Bolsheviks. The HO-229 embodies a timeless tension in military history, innovation versus production. Nazi Germany fielded the world's first operational jet fighter, ME-262, the first ballistic missile, V-2 the first cruise missile, V-1, and the first flying wing jet, HO-229. Each represented genuine technological breakthroughs. Each came too late, in too small numbers, to influence the war's outcome. Meanwhile, the Allies built 18,000 B-24 Liberators. They manufactured 15,000 P-51 Mustangs. American factories produced one aircraft every 295 minutes. Quality was good, Quantity was overwhelming. Albert Speer, Hitler's armaments minister, reflected after the war. We had superior designs, but we lost the arithmetic. America produced 10 adequate aircraft for every excellent one we built.
10 against 1 means the excellent aircraft always dies. Hermann Göring, facing execution at Nuremberg, gave a bitter assessment. We reached for the future when we needed to survive the present. The HO-229 should have flown in 1942. By 1945, it was a magnificent irrelevance. The sole surviving HO-229 V-3 now rests in the Smithsonian's Stephen F. udvar hazy Center in Virginia. Visitors walk past the partially restored center section, the curved windscreen, the wooden skin, the jet engine nacelles, and they see the shadow of the B-2 Spirit stealth bomber displayed nearby. The visual similarity is uncanny. The same flying wing plan form, the same blended fuselage, the same radar-defying curves. The B-2 first flew in 1989. The HO-229 flew in 1945. Forty-four years separate them, a gap closed not by American ingenuity alone, but by the captured blueprints and physical evidence that Operation Paperclip delivered. The Horton's radical vision, combined with American industrial might and Cold War urgency, eventually produced the most advanced bomber ever built. As for Erwin Ziller, he lies buried in an unmarked grave somewhere near Oranienburg. He never knew he'd piloted humanity's first stealth aircraft. He never saw his widow or children again. He simply did his duty, testing an aircraft that shouldn't have been possible in 1945, flying it to the edge of its, and his, limits. The HO-229 died with him. But its ghost still haunts the skies. Every time a B-2 spirit unfolds from its hangar, and slips into the night, invisible and unstoppable. A dream stolen from a dying regime, perfected by its conquerors, and deployed to defend a world the Horton's Fuhrer tried to enslave. Sometimes, the right ideas arrive in the wrong hands at the wrong time. The Ho-229 proved that. And sometimes, justice means the good guys get to finish what the bad guys started.